Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like you to join me on the next Legal Lines where my guest is Louisiana State Senator Albert Guillory. Senator Guillory is running for Lieutenant Governor, but we're going to have one show about crime and what is his analysis of the events in Ferguson and in New York City with Mr. Garner. His conclusion, excessive force in New York, not in Ferguson, and no racial animus. So join us on the next Legal Lines with State Senator Albert Guillory. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. If you have to hire a lawyer, and I hope you don't, but if you do, hire a lawyer that you like, that you trust, and who specializes in your area of need. In these days, with all the laws we have, lawyers for the most part now specialize. They specialize in contracts, defense, business, personal injury, all kinds of areas of the law. So when you interview with a lawyer, ask him, does he specialize in the area of your need? Has he tried the cases? Has he been successful? And of course, how does he charge you? Is his fee hourly? Is it a percentage of the case if he recovers? What exactly does he charge? So my Legal Lines tip for me, Locke Meredith, to you is, if you have to hire a lawyer, hire one you like, you trust, and who specializes in your area of need. This has been Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. I'm again very pleased to have back on the show Louisiana Senator Elbert Guillory. We're actually following up on the show we just taped. We're going to talk about crime. Senator Guillory, thank you again for doing the show with me. Thanks for having it's, me. It's an interesting topic and um, you know particularly in the context of what's going on uh, with the Ferguson uh, matter and then the incident with Mr. Garner in New York. Explain to me because your background in crime and the, and the size that you've dealt with it on both sides, explain to the folks kind of your perspective. There's a way to deal with authority. And parents need to teach children about authority at home so that by the time they are four or five years old and they go to a school, they understand authority and they can, uh, can uh, inter interact properly with the authority figures in the classroom, the teacher. And that as they grow, they will, they will be encounters with uh, police officers. You cannot challenge a mother and a daddy directly with, with confrontation at home. And you certainly cannot do that with a teacher in the classroom. And you certainly, certainly cannot do that with a police officer on the street. I've had over my lifetime many, 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 literally hundreds of encounters with police officers. The last one being a week or so ago when I was driving a little too quickly to get to court. There's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. And if parents teach children if the family prepares a child to go out into the world, um, they will learn how to challenge and when to challenge authority. And it is not direct confrontation because you can see that, that, that has not well. worked. It that doesn't not, go well. It let's, ends very badly. Let's talk about, the, it, it's like an epidemic uh, in the black community where um, Nine out of ten black men who are murdered are murdered by a black man. Yes. And then you have a huge percentage of the black male population having been in the criminal system. You were a defense lawyer. Yes. Um, explain to the folks why that's happening. Is it this authority issue? Or are there other causes or consequences? The breakdown of the family is, is, is a major, major cause of it. Poverty has, has a, an, an impact and plays a role. But you gave two, two very important statistics. There's a third statistic, and that is that 72 percent, more than seven out of every ten black children are born to single mothers. So there is no family, at least not a full family. No. What you have is young, single women raising children and they don't know how to raise boys. And so boys, and then the it's, 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 same thing is true of girls too, but more so with, with, with males, with male children. Uh, those male children get into difficulty. No authority at home, no authority in school. 
or, or, or confrontations with authority in school and then confrontations with, with police officers. So the there's streets. no man in the family to model the appropriate behavior for his son and child to emulate. It, not just modeling. Modeling is a big part of it, but teaching too. Right. Someone who is say, look son, here's how you deal and, 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 and if you want to succeed in life and if you want to live, these are some of the things that you have to do. Otherwise, you'll never grow up to be a 70-year-old black man. Well, and it's a vicious cycle because uh, a lot of these young men end up in the prison system and, and so they're separated from the, the family or the children that they have uh, and they're subject to a more violent environment and it seems like it's just a snowball that's just getting huge going down the side of a mountain. One of the good things that Louisiana is doing, and, and Louisiana is one of the leaders in this, is the reentry programs um, so that we, we in, in our prisons, we are giving people counseling, uh, drug treatment, education, basic education, uh, trades. We're taking them to work on, on our work release programs so that when they get out, they have, we've changed some of the, the mentality and we have prepared them to, to work so that they don't have to go back to a, a, a life of crime. Well, and I know Louisiana is remarkably, we incarcerate a larger percentage of our population than any other nation in the world, much less the 50, 49 other states. Remarkable. So I'm glad to hear we've got that teaching. How, how do we stop this flow of young men into the prison system and into the, to the gangs and the drug world and the violence. How, is it the family, period? Or you said family, education, are there any other factors? Church, the Republican Party of, of Louisiana is working now on what we call an urban uh, violence initiative so that we are going into churches and we're getting consortiums of churches in, in each city, major, starting with major cities, so that those, we can go into churches and, and teach parenting. There'll be parenting classes and manhood classes so that we can, for those children who do not have a male who can sit down and say, this is what you must do in order to live and succeed, that we're going to do that. Uh, someone has to do it, and, and we're taking it upon ourselves to go and do it. And, and we've talked about this before, but it seems that for a large percentage, you just gave the statistic, I think 72% of, of black babies are born out of wedlock with no man in the house. Um, how, that seems to be a cultural problem that has developed over time. How did we get there? The Great Society has been heavily responsible for it, for this, this concept of um, you can have as many children as you'd like and we will pay you to have some more because w with each child that you have, you, you get more support. And the concept of, uh, of social security disability where we pay children, we give checks to children who are violent and disruptive. And in order to keep getting the check, they have to keep being disruptive forces. Amazing. Otherwise, the checks get cut off. So, so an incentive to continue the bad behavior. Incentive to continue bad behavior. Incentive to, to not work. In my neighborhood. Incentive not to get married. Oh, of course. And even if you have a, a man in the house, a woman's living in, in uh, public housing, and she has three children, and she's receiving housing and welfare and food stamps. If a man comes, if she starts to have a, a firm, permanent relationship, that man is found to be there, she loses her, her home. Uh, again, an incentive not to develop a mature, stable relationship. So how do we change that system? What do we do to disincentivize, to, to take away the rewards for, for behavior that has absolutely destroyed, seemingly, the black family? We have to go into the black community and, and start teaching through, through the churches and through the education system. We have to change those attitudes. And with government policies, we have to have government policies that will incentivize positive behavior, okay. not the kind of humbug that we've had for the last 50 years. All right, we'll continue right. this on the next segment. This is Locke Merritt with Legal Lines. Our Louisiana Senator, Elba Guillory, will be right back.
Hi, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for being our Legal Lines audience for almost 15 years. Our audience now is over 500,000 households. I'd also like to thank Cox Channel 4 and my friend Eric Coleman for being with me from the beginning. From all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith again. Pleased to have on the show again our Louisiana Senator Elbert Guillory. Senator Guillory, let's dive back in. So we talked about the cultural kind of societal reasons for the young black men being, I guess almost in a way, destined for the criminal system because there's no male modeling, there's no male teaching. Um, they're, they're just kind of like they're, they're set on a course that direction unless there's some type of intervention that's heading that way. But let's also talk about the fact that, that apparently there's societal um, procedures and processes that result in maybe intentionally or not intentionally a targeting of, of the black community. Explain what you've observed, please, sir. Well, let's start with the, the, the arrest uh, and, 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 and their steps throughout the, the criminal justice system, and, and you'll see these kinds of problems. And let's point out again, you, you have been a criminal defense lawyer for 44 years. Yes. So you know what you're talking about. If you were walking through a high crime rate area and you are dressed in a way, in the same way that many people who commit crimes dress, if you have a baseball cap turned around on your head and wearing a hoodie, some saggy pants, uh, the probability, and you in walking through a high crime rate area, even if you are as pure as the driven snow, the probability is that you're going to be arrested. So you're asking for it? A little uh, bit? None? At least a little. I mean, you, you would to... hope that wouldn't happen, you know, that just because you look like that, they're going after you, but is it unreasonable to, to make that connection? I have sons, and I, I explained to my sons, if you want to get arrested, this is how you dress. Interesting. And this is when you're walking through your community. That's just the way so it is. So educate, at a minimum, put them in a position where it's an educated choice. Absolutely. Then there are, are rules in the, in the justice system. Drugs, for example. Um, cocaine. Powder cocaine would get you five years, the same amount of powdered cocaine, the same amount of crack cocaine would get you 25 years. More white people use powder cocaine, more black people use wow, crack cocaine. I did not know that. Because yes. it's cheaper? I mean, powdered uh, versus crack is price yes, difference? Price, price difference. But same quantity, same drug, uh, very disparate uh, sentencing. And Many people, the, the war on crime does not target the people who bring drugs into the United States on boats and in, in, in airplanes. It targets little street guys who deal it. And so the little street guys who deal it, if he's wearing the criminal outfit that we just described, uh, then he's going to be arrested and he's going to go to prison for small quantities, and we're, we're changing that in, in sentencing in Louisiana. And that's something that I'm, I'm going to continue to work on as lieutenant governor. And you're not saying that they shouldn't have some penalty. You're just saying the, the penalty for doing an Ill illegal act, in that case dealing a small quantity of, of drugs, uh, is, is not appropriate. That's correct. Small quantities for nonviolent criminals, uh, there should be more reasonable uh, consequences. Because I know for a while legislatures at the federal and state level were mandating certain minimum sentences and it was tough stuff. Was, the judge had no discretion. Stuff. That's correct. That's changing. That's changing. Good. And in sentencing, and this is something that we, that we have to know about, if you walk in with a pair of earrings and some tattoos on your face and your neck and your arms all tattooed and wearing the same kind of outfit that we described, you're not going to get the same consideration from a judge as a kid who walks in uh, with a coat and tie and he looks like uh, he just stepped out of church. So the judge is interpreting that visual information as this person is not necessarily um, regretful of, of their activity as compared to the other person? Or is it a racial, intended racial discrimina discriminatory behavior? I don't think it's an intentional racial issue. 
I believe that it is a subliminal racial issue, but it is real. It is what happens in the courtrooms day after day. So it is what it is, and, and you better, again, educate them the consequences. That's correct. Someone has to say, if you're going into court, standing in front of a judge, and I do this with my clients all the time, I want my client to look just like the lawyer. Uh, leave your earrings at home, cover your tattoos, put your coat and tie on, and come and look and sound like you are on your way up the ladder of success in America, and the judge is going to give you a better shot than the other guy who comes in wearing the criminal outfit. Well, and I court. know uh, Judge Tony Marabella operates the drug court here in East Baton Rouge Parish, and uh, for the nonviolent violent folks, like you said, um, they put them on a, like a probationary period, and he almost becomes their parent. They have to get educated and get a job and have a, a certain term during which they're exhibiting the appropriate behavior and not relapsing and all that. And it's, it goes better. Yes, those drug courts have, have been really good for Louisiana. Because something folks need to understand is the recidivism rate, the rate, you know, if somebody's in prison, they get out, are they going to go back in that prison? It's really high, like 80 or 90 percent, is it not? Yes, 70, 80 percent. And so we, what we're doing is not working. We're driving down the recidivism rate in Louisiana to, in some, some of the programs that we have, to under 50 percent. It is working very well. And that's because our system is now, the criminal system is giving these folks another option. Yes. And, 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 and much better preparation. Tools, exactly. Giving folks jobs and changing the, the mindset, uh, anger management and career counseling and social counseling. It is, is working. Jimmy LeBlanc is the secretary of the Department of Corrections and he has done a magnificent job. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. So what other factors are you seeing just systemically within the criminal system that it naturally results, maybe not intentionally, in the targeting of the black community? Those, the, the kinds that we've talked about are really the, the, the ones that are the, the major problems. And, and the response, as you've also accurately pointed out, is, is education. We have to educate the young men who are around the system and who are, are going into the system how to conduct themselves so that they will not become a part of that system. So, and we have to make those changes uh, in the mindsets of judges. and. I, that's a long-range problem. I don't see the solution to that because that is something that, that government can't, can't touch. Do we have within the criminal system procedures or processes that try and address that potential racial component that, that might exist in the system? We've started dealing with it at the, the, prof, the racial, it's called racial profiling, uh, at the arrest level. We started dealing with it with police officers, but that same subliminal message exists in the minds of the people, probation officers and uh, judges and su Supreme Court judges, all the way up through the system that, that, that issue exists in America. It is. We just have to teach folks how to deal with it. And so it's a cultural problem that's just going to take time for folks to be educated. All right, we'll continue this on the last segment. This is Locke Meredith with our Louisiana Senator Elbert Guillory. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where we're talking about the law and you. The law is nothing but an exercise of power by a government over you. But because our framers and our Constitution knew that power could be abused and corrupting, they chopped up power between the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judiciary, and you. So join us on the next Legal Lines, where knowledge is power. Hello, welcome back to Legal Lines. Again, I'm Locke Meredith, and pleased to have on the show Louisiana Senator Elbert Guillory. We're talking about crime, and now we're gonna talk about the Ferguson matter, and also the event where Mr. Garner was killed in New York. Interesting, because it seems that uh, the black community, not just black community though, in the white community too in some respects, um, there's been this explosion of anger at how the events took place in Ferguson and, and uh, with Mr. Garner in, in New York. Explain to me what's going on. The statistics are not good across the country. 
there's a lot of interaction between police officers and young black men. And too often, young black men wind up dead on the streets. Uh, that, there are a couple of problems. We were talking earlier about authority and, and how to confront authority. And we really must, we in my community, must do a better job of teaching our young men not to confront police officers on the street because that is a sure for way to have a funeral soon. Um, now, I, Senator Gill, I, I just, what's striking me is, is that I've, I've heard statistics where it compared the, the death rate as a percentage of white individuals being killed by police officers versus the percentage of black individuals being killed and that it was either close or maybe even a little higher for whites. Now, I don't know the accuracy of all. I've heard that discussed. And so I guess my question to you is, is, are the police officers doing something wrong or is this a systemic problem too where they're, where they're in ways almost sensitized to the, the fear or the danger of the situation? I think that, that police officers could use, a, uh, many police officers could, use, and I'm from law, law enforcement family, uh, many police officers could use a little bit more training and perhaps a little more restraint. In the Garner case, there were five officers. Uh, the man resisted arrest, and so he was taken down properly and appropriately. After he was taken down, it was not necessary to, uh, to with five officers there, to, to restrain him, cuff him, ankles and wrists, and take him off to the police um, station. It was not necessary to continue to use an illegal chokehold on him. In, in Baton Rouge, there were, so that's, that's police overreaction. And I would think a lot of folks, didn't matter what color your skin is, red, white, and blue, would agree with, with your analysis. Um, you know, it's interesting too, because all he was doing was selling a cigarette. Yes. And it escalated because of how he was uh, confronting authority. Yes. Kind of what you've talked about. And from there, it went downhill. Very quickly. Okay. There was a young man in, in Baton Rouge who was in his house. Uh, his door was kicked in by the Baton Rouge PD. They went into his, kicked in his bedroom. He had five rocks and he tried to swallow them. Cocaine rocks? Cocaine rocks. Okay. He tried to swallow those rocks. He was beaten so that the, the whole scene was just bloody by beaten, kicked, stumped by police officers to the point where he couldn't swallow and choked to death. That's another police overreaction. So uh, it's abuse of force. Yes. Excessive force. Excessive force. Now, now they would say, I'm, I'm pretty sure is that that there have been police officers killed because they didn't use sufficient force yes. to, to tie a guy down or up or whatever they subdue him, needed to do to subdue him. So really what we're talking about is them being able to accurately gauge the amount of force they need? Exactly right. And, and, and gauging that amount of force has a lot to do with the amount of resistance. The guy in Baton Rouge was not resisting arrest. The only thing that he was doing was trying to swallow a baggie with five crack rocks in it. Uh, there was no need to, to beat him right. to the point where he couldn't even get the, the drugs down. I mean, if he'd gotten them into his system, uh, so be it. I mean, just wait for them to come out because they're coming out. Okay. So the officers, in your view, need greater training on when to apply force and how much force to apply depending on the circumstances they encounter. Yes. And of and course, the, and the, the more dangerous the circumstance, the more likelihood and probably appropriate that they're going to use force and it may be significant. That's correct. Okay. And we also need to train the, the, the tragedy of the 12 year old with the toy gun. Yeah. If police officers say, drop what you have in your hand, you really do need to drop it and drop it quickly. Because if you have a toy gun in your hand and the cops tell you to drop it, he doesn't know whether it's a toy That's gun right. or a real gun. And if he, he, he knows that you can use that gun to shoot him, he, out of self-protection, he's going to drop you first and he, un, 
terrible tragedy, 12-year-old kid. I think a lot of the problem seems to stem from the general public's um, inability to understand the heightened nature of a police officer because the police officer's world and how he evaluates risks is completely different from the general public's. Would you agree? Absolutely. When he, in the morning, when he straps on his, his belt and says goodbye to his little curly-haired daughter, he does not know. That's a special moment for police officers because he doesn't know that he'll be able to come back and see her that evening. He could be dead. Absolutely. And so he is trying to protect himself, trying to return to his family, trying to, to, to do his job. And if someone is starting to resist arrest or attack him or not, or hold, or they're holding a, a gun, and which may, may be tar and may be real, and he, he doesn't know it, he's going to respond from that mind, mind frame, that right. mindset. He wants to get back home to his daughter and to his wife. So in the particular instances of Ferguson with Mr. Brown, who was killed, um, as, and Mr. Garner in New York, have you seen any evidence that indicates those officers were acting uh, because of racial motives? I don't think that they were acting because of racial motives. I think that uh, in Mr. Garner's case, he resisted arrest and one officer held him in a chokehold too long uh, and, and perhaps unnecessarily. I don't think it had anything to do with race. They had a large man who was resisting five officers right. who were trying to arrest him. Uh, in, in Ferguson, the office, I don't believe that race was a, a, a factor. Uh, there's a man who had an encounter with the police officer to the point where the police officer was shooting out the windows right. of, the, of the car. Then the encounter, uh, there was some distance. Yes, and then the way. man came back toward the officer, as the witnesses, several witnesses have, have said. I don't believe that it had anything to do with race. I think it had to do with, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the way that the man encountered the police officer. So why do we have this great public outcry with all these marches taking place of, of the black community and a lot of white folks saying that those crimes are racially motivated, that the police officers are racially motivated in targeting black men? Do you know? Is it just that there's that mindset that we feel like we're under siege, the black community feels like they're under siege? I think that unfortunately we have people who live on in, in flaming situations. Okay, all right. The professionals who come and do this. Thank you very much, Senator Gillard. This is Locke Meredith with Legal Lines. My very special guest, Louisiana Senator Albert Gillard. Thank you for being with us.